So felt storage are already really powerful out of the box. And in this video today, I wanna to show you how we can make them even more powerful using some pretty cool patterns here. So looking at this example, it's a very contrived example. And I wanna use this example to kind of build on this. And so you can recognize the value in what we're talking about today. So I'm sure you've seen an example similar to this 5,000 times. We have a count store, which technically this doesn't have to be a store. This wouldn't have to be a store here. We could just use a let variable. Um, but in this case here, we're talking about stores and we have this increment, decrement, reset, and square, right? So, and as you can see, when I click on each one of these buttons here, it's going to call that function. So when I increment, it's obviously going to increase the count. When I decrement, it's gonna decrease. When I square, it's gonna square. And when I reset, it's going to reset. So all of this works just as you would expect, right? Now, one thing immediately that you may notice is that what if we passed in like a two here? And when we call reset, we want it to reset to the original value that the store was initialized with, right? Well, unfortunately, we don't have access to that two, right? So we could, of course, manually set it here, but this isn't really dynamic. And we have to update this one every time we update this one. So it's not really a great solution. So as you can see, when I click on reset, it goes back to zero. Another problem arises when you want to reuse the same logic throughout, you know, many count stores across your application, right? Now, of course, you could always copy all these functions over or put the functions somewhere else and pass the store into them and do it that way. But that seems like a bit much to have some basic functionality like this with every count store. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to create a custom store that implements all of these methods. Then we're going to kind of build off of that. And then we're going to look at some more advanced higher order stores that have been built for Melt UI, as well as some other ones throughout the community. So I have this file here called count store. And what it's going to do is going to have a function called create count store. It's going to take in an initial value, which in this case here is going to be a number. And what, are, what it's going to do is we need it to return a store. So at a very minimum, we need to have a subscribe method, right? So what we're going to do here is we're just going to initialize a new store inside of this one, inside of this function called initial value. And then we can just return the count like that. So count is going to have a set subscribe and update methods. So basically this is just like a duplication of what we already have right here. It's not going to do anything different where it gets really cool is that we can actually add those functions we have inside of this function here. So let's just copy all of these over and put them in here. And then what we can do is we can actually return increment, decrement, reset, and square. And we save that. And then instead of going here and saying writable, we'll say create count store. We can get rid of writable. And now we can access all of these methods using count.increment, count.decrement, count.square, and count.reset. So if we save that and we try to use our uh, count store here, we're gonna see that it does in fact work the exact same way. So remember I said, if I hit reset, I wanted to reset to the count that the store was initialized with. Well, now we actually have that capability. So if we go back into our create count store here, we have access to the initial value through the arguments, right? So instead of doing count.set zero here, we can do count.set initial value. And so now when I add a few, remove a few, and then click reset, it's gonna reset back to the initial value. So that's one really cool added benefit you get out of the box. And of course you could do all kinds of really cool stuff in here. I'm doing some cool stuff with uh, DayJS where I'm kind of transforming a date into a DayJS object, doing some different date manipulations, and then putting it back into a date object when I write it. And that's pretty cool. Um, but one example, of something that you can implement immediately is let's say we want to be notified whenever the count store changes. Now, of course, you could just set up a reactive statement here and say console log count count like this, and it's going to be called whenever the count is updated. It's a reactive statement. Again, the same problem kind of um, comes into play though, because we have to call this everywhere that we are wanting to do this, right? Whereas instead, it'd be cool if we could just pass in like a function here that would be called whenever this count changed. And we could apply different functions to all the different count stores that we have. So how can we do that? Well, what we're going to do is we're pretty much going to override the update function and we're going to kind of intercept the update and actually still update the store, but also have access to the updated value so we can then pass it into our change function. So I'm just going to set up another argument here called on change. It's going to be optional. And it's just going to be a function that takes in a number and doesn't return anything. So here we can actually set up a custom update function. So we'll say update. And what does this take in? This takes in an updater, which it actually comes from um, svelte slash store, and it's going to take in a number as its generic argument. And if we look at the writable here, we can actually see how that's implemented. We look down here at update. So update just takes in an updater. It pretty much calls that updater function with the value of the store and then sets it, right? So that's basically what we're implementing here. So we have the updater function. So now what we can do is we can say count.update, 
and we can say current. And what we want to do is we actually want to do exactly this. So the new value, we're going to call the updater function that was passed in that the user passed in. And we're going to take a look at this here in a second, but we're calling the updater function with the current value. And then we're getting access to that new value here, which we can then pass into the on change function if one is passed in. And then we'll return that new value just as the update function normally would. And so then we can just pass this here. It's going to override the update that was returned from count because we're applying it after the count was spread. And then instead of doing count to update for all of these, we're actually going to do update just like this. And then we'll actually make this an update as well. So we'll say update and we'll just set it to the initial value like that. Okay. So let's just test to make sure this still works. As you can see, everything is still working just as you would expect. We can square it. We can reset it to two, except now we can actually pass in a custom function here. So we can just say function on change. It's going to take in a value, which can be a number. And I just want to console log count change to value. And then I'm just going to pass this into this here on change, just like that. And then now if we open up our browser's dev tools here and I increment the count, you're going to see that the count was changed to this. So you could really do whatever you wanted here. If we wanted to, you know, do some complex logic with that new value, we could do that. Uh, we could update another store. We could do a lot of really cool things with a simple on change like this, right? We're basically watching and taking action every time this changes. Now, one thing you'll notice here though, is that like when I click on reset, technically it's not changing, right? The count didn't really change. It stayed the same. Sure. The update function was ran, but the count didn't actually change. And we could actually handle that as well. So let's say that we wanted to make sure that um, if the new value is not equal to the current value, then we're going to call on change. Otherwise we're not. So let's just clear this out. So now when I click on reset here, since resetting would bring it to the same count it's currently at, it's not going to call that on change function. So now I want to look at some more advanced use cases and where you might want to use some of these custom store patterns here. So this is really more so a uh, higher order store, as I believe is what Li Hao calls this, where it takes in a store and returns a store. And this was written by Thomas Lopez, who is the creator of Melt UI. And this was created out of a need for users or developers to be able to pass in a custom on change function and then have access to what the value currently was, what the value was being changed to, and then whatever they returned from that function would actually be what the store was set to. So they could essentially override something that we were doing internally, depending on some type of logic. And this is really interesting. So it's typed as a generic here because we're using it all over the place inside of Melt. Basically, every value store is an overridable. And it takes in a store and it also takes in an on change function here. And as you can see, similar to what we just did in our count store, we have a custom update function here that's being called. And again, it's very, very similar to how we're handling it inside of our count store here, where we're doing update, the new value, except in this case here, we're actually passing the current and the next to this on change function. And whatever it returns is actually what is set in the store. So the user or the developer could override our decision based on whatever logic they deem necessary. So this is a super powerful pattern here that we just basically pass in a store and it instantly turns it into an overridable and then updates that store under the hood. So this is a really, really cool pattern. Um, Melt UI source code is full of a lot of really, really cool uh, ways to use Svelte, some really advanced things. So if you're interested in those next level concepts, next level patterns, it's definitely some great source code to look at. Again, Thomas is brilliant and wrote this. So I'm not taking any credit for this. This was incredible. And we were doing things a lot more manually and he kind of stepped in and was like, Hey, why don't we just make this overridable function that could return a new store that we can then just have be overwritten at any point in time. So this is really cool. And then another really cool implementation of a custom store is by Josh Nuss on GitHub. I believe he also has some really good Svelte courses as well. So definitely check him out. I'll leave his links down below, but this is his, uh, Svelte local storage store, which basically keeps your Svelte store in sync with local storage and vice versa, right? So. When you update your store, it also updates the local storage. It gets it from the local storage, the initial values. So it's really, really cool. And you can see here that this is obviously the old deprecated um, function here. But if we look at the persisted function, which is what uh, creates that custom store, that local storage store, you can see here, of course, they're taking in options. This one's much more complex because of what it's doing. But if we look here, it's very, very similar, right? So update, the callback is the updater function. And then it's getting the value just as we did inside of our count store here. So the new value, and then it's updating the local storage with that new value and then returning that value. So it's basically updating the store at the same time. It's updating the storage, the local storage as well. So again, another really cool use case for custom stores. So 
that's it for this video. I wanted to give you an introduction to custom stores, kind of get your mind thinking about how you might be able to, you know, implement some reusable logic inside of stores and really leverage them to their fullest potential. So if you found this video useful, I'd appreciate it if you drop a like and subscribe. Thank you all so much for watching and I will see you in the next one.